conversations across town. Conversations across town. Conversations across cross town. Conversations across cross town. Conversations across town. Good evening. I am Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th President of the United States. I, have, I am appearing on the show to discuss uh, my experiences in the House of Representatives when the speaker was Sam Rayburn and the president was Franklin Delano Roosevelt and how that shaped me into <coughs> being able to handle the, the House and the Senate so I can, so I can help to push through uh, the, the initial start of the New Deal and then later on the Great Society and the New Frontier under President Lyndon, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy and, and how, the, how those programs were essential dealing with poverty and and uh, preventing social upheavals hello i'm president theodore roosevelt jr 26th president of the united states sometimes referred to as teddy and sometimes referred to as tr <coughs> i was born into great wealth but i'm mo most remembered for what I did for the average person. I was very progressive in my policies by busting up the trust that, that ran rampant over the economy in the early 20th century. I learned from my experiences working with the people, being a soldier in the Spanish-American War and being side by side with the common people. And I used my power to try and create equality of everyone. And we'll discuss that today and how, it, how, how all of these things are seen in the light of today's situation and problems. Thank you. Hi, I'm Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. I was Associate Justice of the Supreme Court from 1902 till 1920. I was appointed by fellow panel member, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt. I am best noted for my uh, view of the First Amendment and the limitations on the First Amendment, I coined the phrase clear and present danger. And the example I gave was, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater if there's no fire. And that would be very applicable to what happened January 5th in uh, the Capitol building. Wow. Uh, good evening and welcome to another episode of Conversations Across Time. You've met, you've met our guests. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. We are, tonight's topic is a continuation of last week's topic and that is capitalism. Is it working? And that being said, uh, President Johnson, you, you mentioned that you, you were when you first came to Washington, D.C., you arrived as a young congressman and you were uh, a part of working towards President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. You want to give us some background on that? Uh, certainly, ma'am. As I've stated previously, uh, when I was a teacher at the Wilhausen Mexican School, I noticed all these children boys and girls who are going to school, but they're going to go nowhere, literally nowhere due to the color of their skin. And I thought that'd be, that was a tragedy. And that I could not accept that. I had some racist attitudes, I'll admit, but I was able to see the humanity in these dark-skinned young people. And these young people that had no future, that had no, no future. 
That's right. And if they have no future, they, to the extreme, up, they have nothing to lose. And so I had to do something for, and I noticed, I knew all about the, uh, the poverty and unemployment uh, following uh, the crash of 1929. Po poverty was rampant. And extremists in the right, the fascists of, the, of that era and the Communist Party were gaining momentum, gaining some followers, not really a threat to the government unless you count the, the Wall Street coup that certain Wall Street financiers were plotting to organize an army to overthrow President Franklin Roosevelt. And it took a very courageous and patriotic Marine Corps officer, General Smedley Butler, to repress it. Um, but the lesson I have learned is that if you give working and low income people the opportunity to rise higher in life, either with education or a good paying job and the ability to have good housing and good medical care, a lot of social problems can be relieved and the danger of upheaval and revolution and extremism could be greatly reduced. But now we're in an era where uh, ever since uh, Mr. Reagan attained the presidency, uh, taxes were, this tax system was fixed to benefit the most wealthy and the most and the corporations so much that such a huge company as General Electric not only paid taxes, paid no taxes, but they had a tax refund. And there's a few others like that. I'd like to get that deal if I could. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all, Ms. Crawford? Yes. Uh, so now President Roosevelt, as a as a person who was labeled a progressive, your, your idea, your ideas would seem antithetical to your, to your wealth. It would seem as, as though one would be surprised and one is surprised to, to see how committed you were to a, what did you call it? I think well, you called it a fair deal. Was it a fair deal that you- Fair made? deal, yes. Fair deal. Well, because, the fact that the fact that I was born into a wealthy existence didn't diminish the fact that there were so many people in this country, the richest country in the world, even at that time, that were not living up to the standard, that weren't able to live up to the adequate standards that were necessary to have a, a, a profitable life, a good life. And it bothered me. I mean, I, I took an oath as the president to, to protect the people and do everything I can for the people, not just the wealthy people. I know that for a long time, it seemed like the Republicans, all the Republicans, that's all they cared about. Tax breaks for, for the tax, the wealthiest taxpayers and subsidies for the oil companies when, when, they were, uh, when they had oil to sell it at high prices to everybody and they were still getting subsidies. Subsidies to the farmers when, when, when for whatever reason, uh, there was a bad winter. I mean, they were giving subsidies to everybody, but they weren't giving subsidies to the people that really needed it. And the people that really need it don't want subsidies. They just want an equal opportunity to be able to, to get their share of what is fair, and that's why it's the fair deal, what's fair in this country. And yeah. that persists today. And unfortunately, uh, because of the political system where the minority has a tremendous, tremendous pull over everything. I mean, it, the general populace has the same ideas that I had. However, they're thwarted by those people that still are represented, who represent the wealthiest people whose po political lives depend on it because they're supported by the large corporations and wealthy people. So the yes. lobbying, uh, all of those campaign contributions, gerrymandering so that they are, they're able to, to get things done. 
it's a combination of horrible things that have allowed the wealthy to to to, to allow the the gap the wealth gap to to get as wise as it has right they, con they continue to do it they have the money to do it and Unfortunately, the system allows them to do it. You look at Citizens United. I was just know, getting ready to that, ask Justice Holmes. Right, just talk to Justice Holmes about that. I doubt that he would have voted for that. Justice no, I that, wouldn't have. I, no, I would have dissented on that. The fact of the matter is, uh, I was, I'm, I, I'm a Republican also, uh, not as progressive as President Roosevelt. I believe that President Roosevelt would be drummed out of the Republican Party today. <laughs> And I think I President Roosevelt would be, would be a Democrat today. That's what I think. But that's right. beside and, the, and the, the, the thing is that the power that the capitalist class has, and it's interesting because what Citizens United did was say that corporations are people and have the same political rights as any individual has. But when it comes to responsibility, the same judges and the same Republican hierarchy that wanted the corporations to be considered people for uh, you know, campaign contributions and donations don't want them to be considered people in terms of being able to be sued or held. They do. So the hypocrisy that has permeated American politics today is is absolutely unbelievable and uh, that there may be a realignment of the parties. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, President Roosevelt did go through that. He mentioned, uh, I think last week about that he, he had to run as an independent third party candidate and a progressive ticket, which they called the, by, you know, the bull moose because he was as strong and as uh, virile as a bull moose, but uh, that may have to happen again today to save the country. How sure, but let, let me just say this. All the, no all the noise in the country comes from the extremes on both sides, yes. from the far, far left and the far, far right. And everybody in the middle gets basically screwed because they're the ones that get all the publicity and they're the ones that get the, get the right to say whatever they want to say whenever and ever anybody in the middle wants to say what, what they think is right. And by the way, what most people believe in, they get drowned out by all of that noise. So all of that has to stop. It's all it's all a part of the political process that has to be revolutionized. Yes, and and as I see it, the thing if I were on the court today, the thing that would uh, cause me the greatest amount of concern is that we're moving toward minority rule. I always believed that even in the courts and how we interpreted the Constitution, the rights of the people were supreme, and if the people wanted something, even if it wasn't the best thing, even if it wasn't maybe the, the most sane thing that the people in a democracy deserve to have it. And what we're Absolutely. having now is we have minority rule where uh, major vast majorities of the people, overwhelming majorities uh, want uh, background checks on guns, or want social programs. And the people in power, especially in the Senate with the filibuster rule, won't let it happen. So you have a, a very small majority of people controlling policy for what is needed for the vast majority. President it's absolutely true because in the Senate, even though it's split 50-50, the 50% of the Democrats represent about 60% of the populace and the 50% yeah. of the Republicans represent 40%. Yeah. And then with the filibuster, you need 60 votes to pass something. It's like saying that a, a super minority, uh, you know, an unbelievable minority of people 75% of the people in the country could want something and the minority could squash it. But I that's want to not ask democracy. President Johnson, how does he feel? Because as someone who was a consummate vote counter and able to able to get what he wanted um, from from opposing uh, from opposing views, viewpoints, how do you feel about the Supreme Court today? Well, it goes to show you that all that these learned justices, with all due respect to Justice Holmes, are, are political appointees with, uh, with the political opinions about who the law and who the government should benefit. Like, like you take the uh, Citizens United case. Mm -hmm. It's based on this premise that uh, 
millions of dollars in campaign contributions are, are some sort of free speech, which, which means that a plutocrat that donates a million dollars has, has a lot of way far louder voice than a working person who can, can just contribute $10. And democracy is definitely in jeopardy when that happens. Yep. Well, the perfect example is the voting rights bill that's been proposed by the Democrats now. It's a, it's a terrific bill that, means, that allows everybody a, a chance to vote, which is what democracy is about. And yet it's opposed 100 percent by the by the Republicans. They want to put all kinds of all kinds of block blocks, blockades on on people voting, people, people of color, uh, poor people, whatever. They just want their people to vote. They just want to win everything and they don't care how they do it. And they use the system and they con the system and work the system to their benefit. It's just like when they had you know, you talk about the filibuster. Well, there was a filibuster for Supreme Court justice votes, too, you know. But they did away with that. The Republicans did away with it when they had the majority in the, in the Senate so that they could get their Supreme Court justices with, a 50, with 51 votes. And as a consequence, you see the Supreme Court is now six conservatives and, and three, you know, basically progressives. And by the way, when there was an opportunity for Obama to name a Supreme Court justice. He had a year to go in his presidency because the Senate had a majority of the senators, a majority. They stopped his, his appointment and that, that seat was eventually taken by a conservative. So if there's I so many things that the Democrats- I point out that, uh, that, uh, that last year when uh, and Mr. the other guy was uh, running for re-election, oh. uh, uh, but uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was uh, passed away, and and the Republicans in the Senate were determined, hell bent, on getting one of theirs in the Senate uh, just before Justice Ginsburg was called in the grave. I mean, not waiting for the next president to make the appointment, and. It's like hypocrisy anymore is a virtue in the Republican Party. I don't think well, we I could have been confirmed if uh, they had the filibuster for judges when I was uh, nominated by you, President Roosevelt. You don't, you don't think you would be confirmed? <laughs> not, not if I needed 60 votes in the Senate. Yeah. I don't uh, think I would have been confirmed. Nah. I, uh, when I was in, uh, on the Massachusetts Supreme Court, I wrote some decisions that a lot of the uh, conservative senators didn't like. So I don't think I could have been confirmed under those circumstances. I think we ought to discuss in our, in our next segment what the Democrats can do to force the, for, force the hand of the Republicans so that the majority will could, could actually be, be implemented. And I think that's a that's a really a good discussion for, but, for another but, time. But I and I, I think, think you're right. It. And and the key is, and I think what the President Johnson's saying and what President uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's saying, and I'm going to say this is, capitalism and democracy go hand in hand. And and to make capitalism better, to use social programs that President Johnson used and President Roosevelt used, and to open up, a, a President Roosevelt was a progressive. Uh, he, he, he favored the graduate income tax, uh, 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 voting rights back, way back then in 1910 uh, and 1908. Exactly. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, if capitalism crashes and the oligarchs start to rule, we're not going to have the democracy either. Right. I, I agree 100% with that. Democracy. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, but. I uh, say uh, democracy, uh, capitalism anymore. What's that anymore? Uh, when I was uh, working on the New Deal and the Great Society, capitalism was uh, a factory and its workers building products for the owner of the factory to sell. But capitalism anymore is just uh, finance capitalism, which just uh, fattens the coffers of corporate CEOs and corporate board members, and they don't uh, get rich by uh, by building up uh, corp 
uh, companies. They sell portions of the, the company in bits and pieces. And, uh, and with the tax money, with the money they saved on taxes due to the uh, tax bill of 2017 and earlier, uh, they, were, they didn't invest in new plant or hiring new workers. They used it to buy, to so, so dash it in, uh, in foreign uh, bank accounts and buy up more stock in their uh, corporations so the value of the stock would rise. May we, may I, may I ask this, may I invite you gentlemen back next week so that we can have a discussion on, on the impact of, of, of labor and the decline of the labor movement and in terms of where we are now with capitalism, because one of the things that the labor movement did assure was that uh, people were able to work and assure themselves of a better life. And at, because they got they got compensated for the work that they did. So if if you would if you would indulge if you indulge me and and uh, come back next week and let us pick up on talking about that because I see what is happening now with the proposal President Biden's proposal for his infrastructure bill. I see that as an opportunity for labor to reemerge because we're talking about blue collar blue collar jobs. And I think that that may be something that can possibly help to save capitalism. Because as it, as it stands right now, I think we are all in agreement that capitalism is in danger of no longer existing because of the power that the minority rule has been able to exert over the majority of the population. Is that, is that possible? Can we do that next? Absolutely. Time? Sure. We have to come back. Yes, we can discuss it. My pleasure. Okay, okay. And I thank you so much for uh, for joining us uh, tonight. I thank you, the audience, for for uh, coming back. And I would like you to come back next week so that we can pick up a conversation about labor. We are very clear that capitalism is something that goes hand in hand with democracy, as President Johnson said. We are, We will cease to have a democracy if we do not rein in the, uh, the, the leaders who are allowing capitalism to just uh, run rampant. This was, never, this was never the idea of the, or design of this country. So I thank you so much. This has been Conversations Across Time. Uh, join us next week and my guests will return and we will, we will have uh, maybe some solutions, maybe some suggestions that we can offer to President Biden. Thank you, I am Vivian Crawford. Thank you so much, Justice Holmes. Thank you so much, President Johnson. Thank you so much, President Roosevelt. Good night. Thank you. Conversation across town. Conversation across town.